help me God. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of So Help Me Pod. Uh, we're looking forward to exploring uh, the United States presidents very, very soon, but I wanted to include this further context before we get into that uh, and include this incredibly fascinating episode with Dr. Dan McCannon. Dr. McCannon is the Ralph Waldo Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association Senior Lecturer at the Divinity School at Harvard University where he has taught since 2008. He holds degrees from Harvard, Vanderbilt Divinity School, and the University of Chicago. And you will quickly see that he is an incredibly adept expert in the field of Unitarianism. And we cover multiple presidents, including presidents John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, Millard Fillmore, and William Howard Taft. We also speak at length of the service of President Quincy Adams and President Taft after their time in the White House, with President Quincy Adams serving in the House of Representatives and President Taft serving as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Anyways, this was a really fun episode to record. I had a blast doing it. Um, I found out a lot of things that I didn't know, and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Let's listen in. Dr. McCannon, thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. Well, it's really a lot of fun to have this conversation. So uh, you are an expert in the field of which I'm studying, which is really cool to get to talk to you. Um, we're talking about Unitarianism right now and, and the wider uh, prescriptions that it had for four presidents who were self-professed Unitarians, um, both Adams presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, President Millard Fillmore, and most recently, President William Howard Taft. Taft also served as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, since Unitarianism has been around since before the earliest days of the Republic, um, I hope you might tell us about the roots and history, uh, in broad strokes, of course, uh, about Unitarianism and, and why is why it uh, laid into the fabric of our nation. Yeah, so Unitarianism in the United States has a couple of different starting points, but by far the most significant uh, has to do with the founding churches of the colonies of Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay. Uh, so those colonies were Puritan, as is well known, uh, with a, a fairly rigorous uh, Calvinist theology and a congregationalist polity. Uh, they also had a kind of interesting uh, relationship to the uh, the Puritan government in Plymouth and Massachusetts, such that um, those congregations uh, uh, received tax support well into the 19th century. But it wasn't a kind of top-down tax support. It was tax support um, from each town to their own local congregation. And over the course of the 18th century, some uh, Puritan congregations in New England began absorbing uh, Enlightenment influences, uh, understandings of the importance of reason, a more optimistic uh, view of human nature than the Puritans had originally had. Uh, uh, and that led to several adjustments in traditional uh, Puritan doctrine, uh, beginning with the Arminian idea that people uh, can choose whether or not to accept uh, the gift of grace and salvation and culminating with the specifically Unitarian idea uh, that the doctrine of the Trinity is not scriptural uh, uh, and uh, that God should be understood as a unity and Jesus Christ should be understood as a human being with a divine message uh, rather than as God incarnate. Uh, so Unitarians, when they crystallized as a denomination, uh, between 1805 and 1825, embraced that Unitarian idea, but they would generally say uh, that their rejection of a kind of Calvinist pessimism about human nature was more important to who they were uh, than Unitarian doctrine as such. 
It, that is so interesting. Um, it seems that this fledgling denomination was coming to bear as some of our first presidents were were entering office. And and, and then I'll also say that my wife is from from Massachusetts, so we have a deep affinity for the for New England, even though I am a Southern boy myself. Uh, <laughs> okay. However, however, to focus in on 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 Adams, the Adams presidents, and then Taft too. We'll get to Millard Fillmore in a minute. Uh, uh, these men are men of deep conviction. Um, John Adams described himself as a church-going animal. Uh, Quincy Adams is said to have attended church three times a day when possible, sometimes different denominations depending on who was preaching, which is always interesting to me. Uh, and Taft refused uh, the presidency of, of Yale uh, because he would have had to have taken an oath to a triune God, right? Like these, some of these, some of these realities that we have of uh, of the of these men are, are they're very deep in their convictions set in their beliefs uh, i'm wondering if you see any through lines in their deep religious uh convictions and its relationship to their unitarian beliefs yeah i think there are a lot of through lines uh connecting these four presidents uh and for me uh, uh the most important through line is their understanding of the importance of strong institutions and their understanding of the interrelationship between religious and political institutions. So the New England Puritans were the consummate institution builders. I, I teach at Harvard University, the oldest and wealthiest university in North America. And it's no accident that these were the people who were first to create strong universities. Uh, they cared a lot about institutions. Uh, they cared a lot about uh, the distribution of power among multiple institutions, even though they were not democratic in the modern sense. So, so in Puritan New England, political power depended on your gender, your race, your wealth, and especially your religious status. Uh, so not everyone had a voice. Uh, uh, but for those men who had a voice, uh, politics was decentralized and participatory. So you have New England town meetings, and then you have all of these uh, institutions, churches, universities, historical societies, benevolent societies that are run uh, you know, democratically by the people who are able uh, to participate in them. So all of the Unitarian presidents care about institutions. Uh, they care about keeping institutions strong, uh, uh, and they care about institutions at the local level uh, as well as at the national level. So all of uh, four Unitarian presidents were deeply uh, uh, committed to their own hometown congregation, as well as three of them uh, were quite committed uh, to what's now All Souls Unitarian, uh, their congregation when they were in Washington, D.C. as presidents. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they you know, put a lot of their life energy into keeping these, these institutions strong. It's no accident uh, that two of the Unitarian presidents, John Quincy Adams and uh, William Howard Taft, were, I believe, the only presidents uh, to hold significant political office after the presidency. Adams as a longtime member of the House of Representatives and Taft, as you said, as, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I think that kind of indicates uh, that their commitment to keeping institutions strong transcended, you know, kind of personal ambition. Uh, and it's no accident uh, uh, that three of the four um, spent significant time as university faculty members. Uh, Adams at Harvard, Taft at Yale, and Fillmore, who did not himself uh, have uh, a college degree, as the founding chancellor of the University of Buffalo. Uh, so this idea that um, education is one of the building blocks of society and, and a good society has strong educational institutions. Uh, that's, you know, there's a lot that these three, these four presidents don't share, 
with Unitarian Universalists today, but a, a deep commitment to education uh, is definitely one thing that they did share. So let's talk about Fillmore for a second, President Fillmore. I mean, he's in yeah. some ways he's easy to skip over, uh, you know, if you're going through the history books. And you know, I mean, he certainly served at a very consequential time, though. He served at a time when our country was uh, dealing with deep upheaval, deep disunity. I mean, we were on the precipice of one of the greatest conflicts this country has ever seen. Um, I hope you might talk about his reality as a Unitarian in the antebellum period and how Unitarians in Northern and Southern regions were dealing with this great conflict that was on the horizon and everybody almost knew it was coming. The matter, the question was just when it would come. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, first of all, let me just say um, Unitarian Universalists today are not thrilled about the fact that Millard Fillmore uh, was a Unitarian, and some of his own contemporary Unitarians um, were less than happy uh, to claim him as a co-religionist. And before you invited me to do this podcast, I knew very little uh, about his connection to Unitarianism. But as soon as I started digging into it, it was clear to me that he was, in fact, a typical Unitarian of his, his time. And and represents some very important uh, trends in Unitarianism at the time. So just to kind of contextualize a little bit about the shape of the denomination in the, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, many uh, Unitarian congregations are among the oldest uh, uh, congregations in North America, uh, both on the uh, the first congregation of Plymouth and the first congregation of Boston are Unitarian Universalist congregations today. Uh, and the, the church that the two Adams presidents grew up in uh, is typical of that. Those kind of uh, churches founded early in the 17th century that later became Unitarian. After the... Uh, 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 the American Unitarian Association was established in 1825. A big part of its work was planting new congregations in, in cities outside of New England. And this, these congregations had a particular role. They had a particular task. And that was to take the kind of classic New England institution building, education minded, uh, benevolent uh, sensibility and make sure it has a foothold in other places. So when people created a new Unitarian congregation in a city like Washington, D.C., or Buffalo, New York, or Cincinnati, Ohio, they imagined that this congregation would be the place where the civic leaders who cared the most about the well-being of their whole community and wanted to exercise power in that community would feel most comfortable worshiping. Uh, and, you know, it didn't happen that way completely, uh, uh, but oftentimes uh, the people who were drawn uh, to these congregations were kind of rising civic leaders uh, who saw their church participation, you know, partly as a matter of individual faith, but more essentially as a matter of a way that they would exercise responsibility for the well-being of the whole community. And the reason I named uh, Washington, D.C. and Buffalo and Cincinnati as cities um, where new Unitarian congregations were planted in the 1820s or 1830s is because these are the congregations connected uh, to the Unitarian presidents. So for Fillmore, uh, the relevant congregation is Buffalo. Uh, he was uh, a founding member of that congregation. Uh, like on um, many churches at the time, uh, the way it uh, funded itself was by encouraging its prosperous members to purchase pews uh, uh, that they could then always sit in and have guests in. So uh, early uh, in the history of the congregation, um, the Fillmore's were able to welcome John Quincy Adams uh, to their pew. Uh, towards the end of, of their time in the congregation, 
uh, ex-president uh, Phil Moore also uh, welcomed Abraham Lincoln to his pew, um, I believe, while Lincoln was en route to Washington to begin his own presidency. Uh, and so Phil Moore, as an ambitious young man without a formal education, without inherited wealth, was drawn to this church uh, in part uh, because he saw it as a place where he could uh, be an institution builder uh, for Buffalo. So he worked with many of his fellow congregants in establishing uh, the University of Buffalo. Uh, as a politician, as you indicated, um, Fillmore was at the center of one of the most significant political events for 19th century Unitarians. Uh, the struggle over slavery and specifically the struggle over the Fugitive Slave Act, um, which was part of the Compromise of 1850, which was a very elaborate piece of legislation that had some anti-slavery components and some pro-slavery components. Uh, but the component that really got the attention of a lot of Unitarians uh, was the Fugitive Slave Act, which basically required government officials in every part of the country to help Southerners who claimed human beings as their property recover those human beings if they had escaped uh, to the North. Uh, and the whole compromise uh, was the work of Fillmore's close political ally and fellow Unitarian, uh, Daniel Webster. Uh, but the controversy uh, over uh, the Fugitive Slave Act split the Whig Party that both uh, Fillmore and Webster belonged to, and that the substantial majority of Unitarians at the time uh, belonged to, and it very nearly split uh, the Unitarian denomination. Uh, so in Boston, which was still kind of the center of Unitarianism, uh, the ministers and lay leaders of the most prominent congregations, like Fillmore, supported the fugitive slave law as, in their view, a tragic necessity. Their highest value was preserving the union. Uh, this was a part of a compromise that they thought uh, would have the effect of preserving the union. Of course, the actual effect was the opposite of what they imagined, but this was in their value system, uh, uh, the constitutional union was a higher value uh, than the basic human rights of the person, people who were claimed as slaves. Uh, uh, so the one Massachusetts congressman uh, who voted for the fugitive slave law was a lay leader at the most prominent Unitarian congregation in Boston, King's Chapel. Uh, he was also, uh, he wasn't yet, but he would become uh, the grandfather of a man who would later serve as the president of the Unitarian denomination. Uh, so Fillmore was, was very much in line with uh, most of the power structure of Unitarianism in saying, we don't really like this law, but it's what we need to achieve our higher goal of the constitutional union. Lots of other Unitarians with a little less power in the denominational structure had very different views. Uh, in Boston, Reverend Theodore Parker, who had been uh, in a bit of contention over theological issues with his Unitarian uh, colleagues already uh, was so strongly opposed to the fugitive slave law that he began carrying a pistol into the pulpit on Sunday morning in case any slave catchers might come into his congregation and try to apprehend uh, a fugitive. Wow. And, and the divisions were similarly heated uh, in in Buffalo, uh, and several members of the church, most prominently a woman named Sally Hawley, uh, uh, whose father had founded the Unitarian Church in Rochester, New York, uh, said, you know, it is not appropriate for us to tolerate in our congregation somebody who would sign into the law uh, such an outrageous violation of human rights. Well, the congregation didn't agree with her, and so it wound up being uh, Sally Hawley, uh, who um, uh, uh, who left the congregation in protest uh, while Fillmore was able to retain his membership. 
Uh, but a few years later, the American Unitarian Association invited uh, Fillmore to preside over their annual meeting. And when he showed up uh, to do that work, uh, abolitionist uh, Unitarians uh, were able to make enough noise and trouble that he couldn't get to his seat and, and do the task he'd been asked to do. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the, the kinds of divisions that would split the country uh, were very much uh, present uh, among Unitarians uh, and uh, and Fillmore was was at the center of that. Well, one of the things that I think that can be said about all of the presidents, and I'm even going to, you know, we talked about this maybe in email about Jefferson could, by some conception of some Unitarians, be looped into this. So let's loop in Jefferson here just for this this conversation. Um, they have deep, deep convictions about the separation of church and state and its yeah. place in our society. Uh, Quincy Adams, of course, famously swore his oath of office on the Constitution, rather in the Bible, uh, which had been the practice of the time and still is to this day by many presidents who swear at the oath of office. Uh, he was still a deeply religious individual. Uh, same with Adams and Taft and Fillmore. They all seem, and Jefferson, and Jefferson especially, they all seem to be, to have a religiosity of sorts um, and, and yet are pro-separation of church and state, which kind of flies in the face of the modern notion, I think, and I would love your opinion on this, of, uh, of this being pro-separation of state is somehow anti-religious, that you can't, you know, there, 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 there's an exclusivity there. And I just wonder your thoughts on that. Yeah, so so to, to fully explain this, I have to sort of double back to something I said at the beginning, that there are multiple starting points for Unitarianism in America. So the most important starting point, as I said, were in the Massachusetts churches, uh, that were themselves tax supported. Uh, uh, but the other starting point has a lot more to do with British Unitarianism, which was never tax supported. British Unitarianism came out of the dissenting churches that were very far removed from the Anglican establishment. And, uh, and one of the leaders of that movement, Joseph Priestley, uh, came to Pennsylvania as a religious refugee and plant and began planting uh, Unitarian congregations there at the same time as Puritan congregations in Massachusetts were evolving in a Unitarian direction. And Thomas Jefferson befriended uh, Joseph Priestley. At one point uh, in a letter, Thomas Jefferson said that he thought the future of the country would be Unitarian. Uh, and these kinds of comments are why some Unitarians in the past have claimed Jefferson as one of our own, even though he was never never a member of a Unitarian church. But certainly when he said nice things about Unitarians, he was thinking about the priestly sort of Unitarians, not the Adam sort, who were his political rivals, at least some of the time, though also his friends uh, some of the time. Uh, and Priestley and Jefferson uh, had a commitment to religious freedom that was definitely inherited by the post-Adams uh, 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 Unitarian presidents, both Fillmore and Taft. Um, so both Fillmore in Buffalo and then Alonzo Taft, the uh, father of William Howard Taft, uh, played very important roles uh, in the political conflicts about the role of religion in the public schools, actually in two different ways. Uh, Fillmore opposed a plan that would have allowed Catholic parochial schools uh, to receive state funding. Uh, that was in New York. And then in Ohio, Taft, as um, Alonzo Taft, as a judge, uh, opposed uh, or, or supported calls to eliminate Bible reading uh, from the public schools uh, uh, on the theory that Bible reading as it was practiced, basically the idea that you can just read the Bible uh, outside of an ecclesial framework was actually an implicitly Protestant practice that excluded Catholics and Jews, even if you were reading texts from the Hebrew Bible, that Catholics and Jews also regarded as scripture. 
Uh, so, so Taft's, Alonzo Taft's freedom of religion decision was in alliance with Catholics. Fillmore's was in opposition to Catholics. But in both cases, uh, they were early advocates of the kind of stricter understanding of separation of church and state that would not be fully embraced by the US Supreme Court until the second half of the 20th century. Yeah. So I'm curious, it's been a hundred years since President Taft served as president, right? Like, yeah. Um, what have Unitarians been up to <laughs> since then? I mean, you know, certainly they've been doing amazing things, just maybe not in, not in the highest political office in the land, but what have they been up to for the past hundred years? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I will just say briefly, um, uh, there's a lot more we could say about Taft, who was a deeply, deeply committed uh, Unitarian, uh, uh, um, who actually served as um, president of the, the Unitarian General Conference uh, in the years after his presidency, his U.S. presidency. Uh, he kind of represented uh, uh, the alliance between Unitarians uh, um, and the kind of Republican Party elite right up to the moment uh, when that alliance broke down. Uh, so uh, there's a there's a, an episode in Unitarian history that I and other uh, professors often teach uh, in which um, during World War I, uh, uh, um, John Haynes Holmes, a very radical Unitarian minister, was asked to write the denomination statement about its role in relation to the war. Holmes was totally opposed to the war, absolute pacifist, but also a socialist who saw uh, World War I as a war for the interests of capital. Uh, he wrote a very balanced report that said Unitarians could have many different views. Uh, and Taft uh, who was supposed to be moderating this debate, stepped out of the moderating role so that he could offer a substitute resolution, quote, that it is the sense of this Unitarian conference that this war must be carried to a successful issue to stamp out militarism in the world. Uh, and 236 people voted for that, nine people voted against it. Uh, so he was very much speaking for the majority of of Unitarians uh, at that moment, uh, but that moment was leading. Uh, and almost immediately after the end of the war, certainly with the beginning of the Great Depression, uh, uh, um, Unitarianism began moving, began a leftward migration, uh, uh, and, uh, and the Taft family, actually began uh, a rightward uh, on uh, uh, migration. Uh, Taft's son, Robert, who was himself an Episcopalian, not a Unitarian, uh, was the leader of the anti-New Deal uh, Republicans uh, in the Senate. Um, so Unitarian Universalists uh, since that time, uh, um, certainly during World War II, uh, I, um, the Unitarian leadership, uh, was, or during the New Deal and World War II, uh, the most prominent uh, Unitarian leaders were staunch New Dealers uh, with a significant uh, socialist and communist fringe. Uh, uh, um, by the 1960s, uh, uh, Unitarian sentiment was fervently in favor of civil rights, uh, fervently opposed to the Vietnam War, uh, fervently in favor of abortion rights, uh, on a whole you know set of issues uh, that kind of set them apart from Taft uh, Republicanism. Uh, uh, even as Unitarians continue to be highly educated, mostly white, institution-minded folks. Uh, uh, another thing that happened in the 1960s uh, is that um, Unitarians merged with Universalists. 
uh, who had always been the more populist, uh, um, certainly not poor and downtrodden, but a little bit less wealthy and well-educated than the Unitarians' uh, counterparts in the project of liberal Protestantism. Uh, the two traditions had, had been evolving in parallel for more than a century, uh, and they came together in the 1960s. Uh, I would say um, Unitarian Universalists probably have remained overrepresented in politics. Uh, you know, we constitute uh, 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 less than a tenth of 1% of the U.S. population. Uh, but we've had a few secretaries of defense in recent years. Uh, uh, Barack Obama um, spent some time as a child in Unitarian Universalist Sunday School. Uh, you know, we still have uh, a lot of connections to political power, but it's fair to say um, uh, the, the leftward tilt of the movement has, has probably allowed connections to educational power to say, stay stronger. Uh, than connections to political power. Dr. McCannon, this has been a fascinating and stimulating conversation. I feel like I've, I've you've covered a lot of ground for us and, and for me specifically. I do have one question that I'm asking everyone I'm interviewing, and this question yeah. is for you. Uh, they do not have to be Unitarian to be clear, but I'm curious who is your favorite president and why? Oh, um... Wow. Uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So my my own political sensibilities are sufficiently anarchist. Uh, well, that, yeah, uh, that's fair. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna need a moment on this. Um, and I respect that, of course. I just yeah. I you know in the in the annals of American history, there has to be one that you at least appreciate it, maybe. For their great uh, contribution. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely presidents I've appreciated, and and it's you, you're making me aware that the question of who's my favorite president is not one uh, I've spent a lot of time with. Um, and to be clear, they uh, all have their problems too. I mean, there's no yeah, per there's yeah. no perfect man who's held that office, but you know. Uh, um. I mean, I think I might go. I might go with John Quincy Adams. I, I wish I knew more about him, um, well, and, and, you know, uh, and not so much for his presidency, as for the sort of um, uh, stalwartness and increasing radicalism of his role in the House of Representatives after his presidency. I mean, I just, I, I guess, I just think that's a really admirable thing to do to kind of jump back in the fray post-presidency. I, I wish Barack Obama would do the same thing. Oh yeah, um, we could use a, a uh, Justice Obama or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, 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 I could imagine Obama being the second half to, to go so, to the Supreme Court. Well, and you know, it's interesting, you talk uh, about Quincy Adams. I mean, you know, I, there is this argument that could be made that without Quincy Adams, there wouldn't have been a Lincoln because Lincoln comes in at a time and sees uh, John Quincy Adams making this big push for abolition um and so so these greats that we talk about later on during the american civil war may not have had the same impact had it not been for john Quincy. i think that's a fabulous answer so yeah. um yeah yeah so dr mccannon thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to me all right well thank you so much and uh i really wish you the best um you've got a lot of really fascinating uh, stories to cover in this project, and I, I hope they all go really well. You've been listening to So Help Me Pod, a podcast of Beloved Journal in conjunction with Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. The podcast is offered in partial completion of the Doctor of Ministry degree for the Reverend Robert W. Lee. All opinions and insights offered are solely owned by that of those who offered them and do not reflect the views of stakeholders in the project. 
there have been 45 men and 46 presidential administrations, all of them unique. Some of them have been more interesting than others, some of them more terrifying than others. All have been part of the grand expression of democracy on the North American continent and part of the wider conversation of self-governance in the world. These men have failed profoundly, and we have failed profoundly in following their leadership along with our own sometimes antiquated and backwards ways of viewing and acting in the world. That said, this form of leadership is unlike few other, and the greatest gift we have has been given in the ways in which the American experiment continues to prosper despite our terrible misgivings. We are better off because of these men, and we are forever in their debt. For more information, visit www.robleethenumber4.com slash presidents.